color of virtue. If virtue has a color, it's not white. Not that pale, all-reflecting, non-hue. Not that color of mourning. If virtue has a color, it's the color of the life within us, dancing with every heartbeat. It's the legacy of our ancestors, the gift of our parents that we try to live up to. If virtue has a color, it's an auspicious one. Red. Blood red. <clears throat> Wednesday. Every day I wake up early, shower, and light the lamps, trying to remember the words that Ama used to say, trying to mimic her motions exactly. Daddy and I eat cold cereal. He gulps his coffee and we're off to school, where he drops me off super early <coughs> so he can get to work ahead of everyone else. I read in the office until I can go to the homeroom, where Rachel and I see each other before class starts. We talk about schoolwork. What did you get for number five? And TV shows, but I haven't watched anything in a while. I look forward to Wednesday afternoon when I go to Rachel's house. But although we eat the same snacks, finish our homework together, and listen to music on WPOP, Bonnie Tyler, Prince, Spandu Ballet, I don't feel like dancing anymore. I don't think I ever will. School days. Everyone at school is kind to me. Classmates, teachers, even the principal and office staff. Ask me how Amma is. Better. Good. I lie. The truth is, things are terrible. Amma is still in the ICU, still having fevers every day, still not breathing on her own. But I don't want to talk about Amma and her illness. When I'm at school, I want to dive into the river of my classes. I want to balance equations, conjugate French verbs, discuss civil war battles, consider xylem and phloem inside plants. I want to lose myself in English books, think about heroes and adventure, not my own sadness, my own worries, my own desperate hope. Everything has changed. My old life has floated away. I hold on to school, to its familiar routines like a life raft, but I feel myself being pulled under. One day when daddy picks me up late, tired, worried, hurrying from work, Pete's mom stops him at the school entrance and Pete comes up to me. I don't want to talk to him, but I can't be rude in front of parents. He says, have you read chapter seven yet in English? <clears throat> I'm not finished, I say, looking at Daddy and Mrs. Brown. Have you gotten to the part where, don't tell me, I want to be surprised. Okay, he says. I risk a brief glance. Today, his eyes are swirled with green. Daddy and Pete's mom wave us over. Reha, says Mrs. Brown, would you like to come over to our house in the afternoons? You can do homework with Pete and your dad can pick you up in the evening after work. You could even stay for dinner any time you like. You need a break, Reha, says Daddy. His eyes are full of hope. He needs a break, too. He can't keep leaving work early every day. We can't keep asking friends to drive across town to pick me up. Thank you, I say, blinking back tears. <clears throat> I feel Pete release a breath. Afternoons are mine again. I walk home with Pete after school to his cozy house. His mom always has a snack waiting for us, veggies and onion dip, fancy crackers topped with salty cheese, tiny sandwiches with the crust cut off, and fresh baked cookies, chocolate chip, oatmeal raisin, or my favorite that she calls kitchen sink, <clears throat> which have a little bit of everything thrown in. We listen to music while we eat snacks and do our homework. I meet Pete's older sister, Penelope, who likes to wear black and has pierced ears many times. Don't ever call her Penny, Pete warns. She'll turn into a monster and bite your head off. But he doesn't have to worry. I think Penelope is a beautiful name, a warrior princess hero, and I never dream of shortening it. Penelope likes me, too, although she always changes the radio station when she comes into the room. Pete and I finish our homework. He is just as smart as I remember, and I smile, because why wouldn't he be? Did I say something funny, he asks. No, I say, the smile still on my face. Good, I wasn't trying to be funny. He covers his mouth with his hand and breathes like Darth Vader. And I laugh out loud, startling myself with the unfamiliar noise. True. Ama is still desperately sick with pneumonia. She is still in the ICU, not getting better, despite all the treatments the doctors try. My visits are restricted to only a few minutes, which, I'm embarrassed to say, is a relief. Ama is asleep, <clears throat> her breathing controlled by a machine. My chest hurts when I see her like this. My ama, who was always in motion, lying so still, moving only when a machine pushes air into her lungs. 
though I make sure not to watch while blood is drawn. The feel of the ICU makes me sick to my stomach, dizzy, weak. How can I be a doctor if this is how the hospital affects me? Daddy can see all this on my face. He tells me I shouldn't visit every day, that I need to do things that make me happy. But how can I be happy when Amma is so sick? I'm afraid that she will never leave the hospital, that nothing will ever be normal again. Will Amma die? I'm afraid to ask Daddy, because I'm scared that might make it come true. And if Amma dies, what happens to her then? I asked Sunny, who says, maybe she'll be reincarnated as a new baby somewhere, or a bird or a butterfly, or maybe she'll be one with God. Pete says, I've been taught that good people like your mom go to heaven. Rachel looks at me seriously. People say all kinds of things, but I don't know. The truth is, no one knows. But, says Rachel, we remember my grandfather each year on the day of his death. We light a candle and think about him and talk about him all day as it burns. So in a way, he's still with us. But maybe, Reha, you don't need to think about this right now. The promise. I am seven years old. Daddy is sick. His belly hurts. We all go to the emergency room and learn that he must have his appendix out. Now. I'm full of questions. Why? Who will do the surgery? What if Daddy doesn't want it out? What will happen? Will Daddy be all right? Daddy will be fine, says Amma. The doctors know exactly how to take an appendix out. What if Daddy dies? It is the worst thing I can imagine. He will not. The doctors, what if Daddy dies? Amma pauses, picks me up, looks in my eyes. Then I will be both mother and father to you. I will take care of you, Rehakana, always. We go home and I tuck into bed right next to her. I don't remember my dreams, but I know they aren't scary. Daddy has the surgery the next morning, and he is fine. Rapids. One day Daddy calls and says he will be late, so I stay for dinner at Pete's house. I feel a pang in not seeing Amma, but she is still asleep in the ICU. Pete's mom makes a big meal. Salad with croutons she made herself. Spaghetti with a spicy red sauce. Meatballs on the side. We sprinkle our pasta with Parmesan cheese from a dish, not a green container like at school. Scoop out the last bits of sauce with garlic bread. We talk, Pete, Penelope, Mrs. Brown, and me, and I can't help glancing at the empty chair. Is Mr. Brown stuck at work too, I ask? Everyone stiffens. He doesn't live here anymore, says Mrs. Brown. I'm sorry, I say. She smiles reassuringly. It's okay, Reha. It's still something we're getting used to. And just like that, our easy conversation has disappeared. Later, Pete and I listen to music on a boombox in his basement. He left for good just a month ago, Pete says. He lives in an apartment downtown. I'm sorry, I say again. Pete's jaw tightens. He says it's better this way. His voice cracks. I say nothing. I have to spend every other weekend with him. He split us apart and will never be the same again. What can I say? I haven't cried in years. Do you know why? I shake my head. Remember Pete bleeding from his face, walking calmly to the teacher. He doesn't like crying, Pete says, his eyes wet. He reaches for my hand and I take it. My arm doesn't tingle because it doesn't feel strange. And I realize we are friends, both living two lives, both rushing over rapids in separate boats.